Good afternoon, everyone. Um, bring up the first slide. Oh, go back one. <laughs> um, so I want to talk to you today about how new communication paradigms are really transforming our ability to solve really difficult problems. And if there's one idea that I want you to take away from this today, it's that the world is becoming more responsive as a result of this incredible transformation and this collision of crowdsourcing and social media and new technologies that are connecting us all together. And so I want to tell you about a story of the, the DARPA Network Challenge. And when Andrew invited me here, we couldn't really decide if it was a story of um, improbable, uh, you know, necessary breakthroughs or necessary failures or improbable uh, connections. And so I hope that as you listen to this, you'll find a little bit of all of those throughout the talk. So I want to begin with uh, a story of, this is the first example I could find of early crowdsourcing. So if you think about this, you have this incredibly rich landscape, and right through the center of the screen, you see this trail that was left by this anonymous masses of people that came before us and helped us navigate this path through this very complex information landscape. And so we have the, the sort of digital equivalent of that that was released a few weeks ago in the product of Google Instant, right? So this is a, a, an incredibly responsive system that starts to to tell me the answer, it can even predict what I'm going to say before I finish typing it. And this is exactly based on the same principles of the crowdsourcing we saw in the earlier slide, which was that Google took the billions of queries that we've all typed into the system and used this to paint a statistical picture of what is the most likely path through this information landscape. And so there's all sorts of incredible responsive systems that we all use every day that are taking input from the crowd. So everything like the Facebook like button, the Yelp reviews, I can now program my inbox with Google's priority inbox. I can tell it what things I think are important and what are not, and it learns from me. I can, I can take the Pandora thumbs and I can tell it I dislike a song and it'll respond by giving me a better song. And it doesn't only make it better for me, it's this crowd input that makes it better for everyone else who's listening to the same kind of music. And so while these are great examples of how crowdsourcing and these sorts of new forms of communication are making our world more responsive, none of these types of, of systems can solve problems that require coordination or collaboration. And so what do I mean by that? What, is, what does that really mean? Well, I want to start by talking about this all came about because of this incredible evolution of the link. So 40 years ago, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, helped create the internet by connecting together these computers in what was the, the ARPANET. And in these sort of 20 years after that, we got the World Wide Web. So this was the first time that you started connecting together all the world's publicly available information. And now there's this new transformation that for the first time, because of digital technologies, mobile phones, and things like this, that we're able to start connecting together people and places and things. And so there's this question that if you can now start connecting everybody, what can you do? Can you actually solve any real problems with that? And so to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the birth of the internet, DARPA decided to have this challenge where they took and hid 10 red weather balloons all around the US and challenged anyone to find them for a prize of $40,000 to really look at, can you use this new layer that connects us all to solve a really hard problem that I think when they issued the challenge, the director of National Geospatial Intelligence considered it an impossible problem to solve using standard means of, of intelligence gathering. And so I only heard about the challenge four days before it started. I got an email from a friend asking if we were signing up at the Media Lab. And so I immediately sent out an email to my group asking if anyone had a $40,000 idea. And what came back was one of the, 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 the members of the team said, well, there's this famous paper on search and social networks, but what we, they conclude in that is that the solution will depend heavily on individual incentives. And so we took that and we thought, okay, there's 10 balloons, there's $40,000, we're gonna give $4,000 to each balloon. So that means that if you sign up, and you find a balloon, I'll give you $2,000. And we're going to give the rest to charity. So everyone feels good, right? And I have this great audience here. There are a couple hundred people. So I can tell you all about it. And you're going to go out and you're going to find these balloons for me, right? But there's a problem, right? Because if, if I tell you, you don't really want to tell anyone else because maybe your friend's going to find the balloon. And then you lose out on your $2,000, right? So we had to rethink this. And we said, well, let's do one step further. 
I want to tell you and I want you to tell your friends. So if you sign up and you tell your friend and your friend finds the balloon, we're going to give him the 2,000 because he did the hard work. But we're going to give you half of the remaining amount. We're going to give you 1,000 because you referred him to us. And you can continue this so on and so on, just having that remaining amount until you end up splitting pennies. So we needed then, uh, we had a great incentive system in place. We needed um, something to keep track of all of this. So I built a website that was at balloon.mit.edu. And it just said anyone would come and they would sign up and they would look at this and they'd put in their email and their username. And what it would do is it would generate a personal URL. So this guy would get balloonmitedu slash Bob. And now Bob could take this and he could go out and spread the word in whatever way he thought was the best. We gave him the ownership of the solution and let him do it for us. And so he would send it out through whatever channels he had available. His friend would click on it. He would come to Bob's website now, except that it would look exactly the same as what Bob saw. He would sign up, get his own personal URL, and repeat this process. And so behind the scenes then, we were building this spontaneous network of people that were drawn together by trying to find these balloons. And so you can imagine that this keeps branching and building more of a sort of family tree. And so something incredible happened. Then we launched the site. So I built the site in two days and then launched it. And nothing really happened right away until a few hours later we got picked up by Slashdot. And so here's what it looks like when you get picked up by Slashdot. <laughs> And I like to think that, uh, as someone commented, that this whole thing would have been faster if there had been a little boy trapped inside of each balloon. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want to try to give you a sense for what it means for there to be this sort of chain reaction and this, this cascade where you start wiring together people, forming this spontaneous communication network that acts like a social nervous system in some sense. We have this distributed sensor network that's all throughout the US listening and looking for balloons. And so um, what I'm going to do is play for you a sound of uh, show. I, I've encoded this spreading process in sound. So what you're going to hear is that somebody who signed up with us directly, like Bob, gets a very low tone. Whereas people who signed up underneath him get a higher tone and so on down the chain. And so just to kind of train you to what those tones are going to sound like, so this would be Bob, this would be Carl, Chuck, or Casey, and so on. And you can imagine this continues going on. And so we're going to jump to the part where Slashdot picked us up. And I've compressed a day's worth of signups into one minute. And I just want you to listen to that. And so as you're listening, this is the actual network that resulted as a, as, as a result of this. What you see are the black dots correspond to people, and the red lines are the connections of who signed them up. So you have MIT at the center, and as you go farther out, you get higher frequency tones. to the lows and the highs. So the lows are people who sort of heard about it throughout the day, and the highs are this sort of spreading process that's going on. <laughs> so we came into the lab the next day. The challenge was about to start. And we thought, wow, this is great. We have this incredible network we've built overnight. And it's spread all throughout the country. So we're just going to like nail this thing. We're going to just kill this com competition immediately. And so we came in, and this is what we found. <laughs> so so <laughs> people are reporting balloons in Canada. Like, what, what happened? Are people hallucinating and waking up and finding balloons everywhere? <laughs> so, <laughs> so clearly something was going on. And it turned out that not everybody wanted us to find the balloons. So you had a lot of, you, you had people, we had thousands of other teams competing, and then we even found out a few weeks later that there was a team within the media lab that went so far as to dress up like DARPA, they went around, floated their own balloons, and they even hacked the GPS coordinates of a photo on an iPhone and uploaded it to Flickr to try to throw people off the trail. 
And so, you know, you think you've got the problem solved, and then you're back to looking at this. And, and so, I, you know, what do you do? Well, one of the things you can imagine doing is we said, well, if somebody tells us there's a balloon in California, but their computer's IP address says that they're in Florida, let's just ignore that. Let's just, they didn't see it firsthand. There's no way. Maybe they found it through Twitter. Maybe they found it through some other means. But let's just ignore that. And so when you do, you go from a map that looks like this to one that looks like this. And so this is, this is better. It's, um, it, it's still missing two balloons, and there are two fake ones from some of the incredible spoofs that were going on. Um, but, but you see that you're starting to get somewhere else. Um, and at the end, so I actually lied a bit that I wish that we had had maps in place the day we came in. But in fact, we were so, the th whole thing happened so quickly that we were really working off of a whiteboard. And I think there's a lesson in there somewhere um, about having the right tools. Um, but so I just want to kind of conclude that, uh, about the balloon story that if you start to think about, so, so it took us in the end eight hours and 52 minutes to find all 10 balloons. And this map shows the, the sort of final coordinates. And you see there are sort of some red balloons. And those were balloons that our team managed to find before any other teams, if you look at the sort of full audit of the logs. And the sort of other interesting point of all this is that um, of the people who ended up giving us the correct solutions to the, to the problem, it turned out that half of them had signed up with us the day before the challenge began which really, I think, shows the power of networks to distribute information broadly and deeply. Um, and so this is great. We were able to build together this spontaneous communication network, cobbled together out of all sorts of things, and we solved this incredibly difficult challenge. But there's sort of, you start to wonder, you know, OK, red balloon's great, but what else could you use this for? What are the other things that you might start to think about um, that are more serious? And so. I want to repeat for you, I, I realize Patrick Meyer told a, a story yesterday um, from the, the earthquake in Ushahidi that I kind of want to gloss over in light of some of the lessons we learned from the balloon challenge. And so the story he told was of this urgent request that came for the GPS coordinates of seven locations where people were known to be trapped. And What's really fascinating is that there was a, you know, it, it was in Patrick's living room in Cambridge, there was a, a graduate student who was really good at finding these GPS coordinates of, of these addresses. You know, in third world country, addresses don't equate to GPS coordinates. And if you need to send a search and rescue team somewhere, you, you need to get these precise coordinates. And so she managed to find six of the seven coordinates. But there was this outstanding one that you see on the bottom right there. Um, which says that she's finished all but one at the Umbon Prix near the Napoli Inn Hotel. And so imagine you're a graduate student, you're sitting in a snowy room in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you're trying to find the GPS coordinates of this building in Haiti. Think back five years ago, what would you have done? I mean, there, there was nothing you could have done five years ago to try to solve this problem. And so what did she do? Well, today she tweeted. Right? She sent it out to the universe. And very quickly, someone got back and said, look, I don't know where the building is, but the hotel belongs to the Holiday Inn. Um, and maybe that's helpful, maybe because the Holiday Inn is near that building. And so the student realized that, oh, well, the Holiday Inn must have a pool. And it's probably the only place in Port-au-Prince that has a pool. So using the satellite images, she found this, this hotel. And that's great. You're now just closer to finding where that building is that's beside the hotel. And then something incredible happened. Somebody tweeted that there was a guy in Brooklyn who used to work at that hotel. And here's his phone number and his address. Call him. And so I think it was Patrick who actually called the guy in the middle of the night. And in mixed French Creole and English, the guy managed to take them on the satellite image of the map, walk them through the streets to where this building was. And so. When you think about this again, you realize that what I think you should realize is that our communication paradigms are broken. And I actually think that's a bit too strong of a statement. What I'd like to say really is that our communication paradigms are in their adolescence. We're just now starting to see some new types of communication that are really transforming our ability to solve problems. And so, this is great. We've known for decades that society is organized around strong ties and weak ties. 
So the strong ties are your best friends and your family, and the weak ties are your coworkers and your friends from high school and those guys you used to drink at uh, the certain bar with in college. And for years, we've had ways of communicating with our strong ties and weak ties through phone and email. And these have kind of evolved over the years to support more complex and nuanced transactions. And, but what we've really seen with Twitter and Facebook is that we have new ways of keeping up with our, our weak ties. And so if you think about Facebook, it's one of the most successful companies in the last decade. And I would argue that the reason for that is that they solved a really hard communication problem. If you think back again, five or 10 years, and you, you ask yourself if you wanted to keep up with your friends from high school or this group that you used to know, not only would it have been kind of socially awkward to just email them or call them and ask them what they're doing and what they're up to, but it would cost you a lot of energy to track them down and find them. And so what did Facebook do? They gave everyone a profile and made it incredibly simple to friend each other and to sort of passively keep up. So they lowered the cost completely for keeping up with your weak ties. And so I think that there's what we're seeing in some of the examples I talked about is that there's this new class of ties that's becoming really, really important as we think about the way that we often find ourselves with people around some shared context, people who we need to con communicate with, but who we don't necessarily share phone numbers and emails or friend linkages on social networks. And I think that this is a real problem. We don't have systems that have lowered the cost to communicate with our spontaneous and temporary ties. And so I think that our communication paradigms are in their adolescence. And I think that if we want to start to see the kinds of magical things that have happened with Ushahidi or with the balloon challenge, if we want to see these new things happen that are gonna just blow our minds, I think we need to really start to rethink the way we communicate. And if we do, I think the world truly will become more responsive. Thank you very much.